Aloha in our day Spread a little aloha around the world And breakfast with Bob Thank you, Poncho Man. Welcome, everybody. Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by Hoka One One Master Spas, Clash USA. You can hyper ice premium plus sports and, of course, form smart swim goggles and our Challenge Athletes Foundation in 2021, we sent out 3,038 grants, totaling $5.1 million to keep athletes in the game of life through sport. Our next guest, one of my dearest friends on the planet, he wrote for us at Competitor Magazine, has become a best-selling author. The books that he has written with Bill O'Reilly have sold 18 million books. It's probably a lot higher than that now. 320 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Mr. Martin Dugard joins us. Marty, how you doing? Bob, uh, as always, it's great to see you. So tell me about your brand new book, which I am excited about, Taking Paris. So, uh, so the backstory is, you know, after 10 years, 11 years of doing killing books with Bill, it looked like we were going to be done. So I thought I had to line up a solo project. And I'd always wanted to do a big World War II, you know, big, iconic, sweeping, cinematic thing. And so uh, basically this book, Taking Paris, isn't just about the fall of Paris in 1940. It's about the, the World War in between in Europe, going all the way up to the liberation of Paris in, in August 1944. So, you know, you've got the resistance, you've got, you know, love and hope and sex and dreams, you got war, you got Rommel, you got Patton, uh, and it moves. I tried to make it one of those history books that was not like a history book. In other words, not boring, not, um, you know, 50 page chapters, it's short. 2000 word chapters. It reads like a James Patterson thriller. And it's just, and we've got a great cast of characters. Well, cast of characters. We, you've got a Hitler, you got the Gaul, you've got Churchill, you got Stalin, you got everybody. Yeah. It's, and you know, the fun thing was, I just started, I really started with Churchill and Churchill led me to everybody else. It was kind of cool. cool. Well, it's funny when I look back, uh, when I knew that, that you were going to be something special, was when all of a sudden Killing Lincoln, Killing Kennedy come out and they're like number one and two on the best sell- New York Times bestseller list. It, when did it hit you that, OK, we've got something really special here with these killing books? You know, uh, I can tell you the exact moment because um, I, it was, I think, sub- the first book, Killing Lincoln, came out, I think, September 23rd, Springsteen's birthday, you know, September 23rd, I think 2011. And um, it was out for a run in Whiting Regional Park, uh, I was about a mile up the trail and I had my phone with me, my agent called and he said, Bill wants to do another book. And I said, why is, is the book doing well? He goes, yeah, you're number one on the list. Um, it's sold a half a million copies in three weeks and let's do more books. And I thought, uh, <laughs> I've never known what that feels like before. So let's keep going. That is funny because you had done a lot of books, right? You had done a lot of books on adventures. You, you followed Stanley Livingston, you followed Captain Cook. So many different adventurers, uh, and you—the cool part was you got to travel and, and and follow the path that they took. Yeah, you know, I, I actually picked the topics for the chance to travel. You know, like when I, I I wanted to go see Australia, so I did Captain Cook. You know, and that led me to England and Tahiti and all those places. And I wanted to see a lion in the wild, which led to into Africa, which is about Stanley Livingston. Um, but, you know, and I had a good career. Like we, when you and I covered the Tour de France together back in 2005, I mean, the book that came out of that, Chasing Lance, I just reread it. It's a fun book. It, it really is like a time capsule, the Tour de France. But, um, you know, I had good success. I just, but, you know, writing is, a, is one of those things where you're only as good as your last book. And I just, um, I've been a writer since I began writing for you back in, I think, 88, 89. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to keep writing for the rest of my life. So I, I got to write books that sell. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> kind of a cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> After you guys did, I think, Lincoln Kennedy Connect, right? The uh, two presidents who assassinated. Yeah. Coming up with the next time, how hard was it to keep coming up with g- killing Jesus, killing Patton, killing Reagan, killing the rising sun, killing England, killing the SS, which yep. actually killing the SS was one of my favorites. <laughs> you know what? Um, it was really easy for me because Bill picks the topics. And oh, so, he does? Yeah. So he he called me. 
where was I? Uh, you know, Lincoln and Kennedy, like you said, were pretty easy. And everybody thought we were going to do McKinley next or, you know, somebody like that. Right. And he, he calls me up and says, we're going to do Killing Jesus. And I thought, oh, man, they, literally, I thought they're going to crucify us because that you just, you know, mess with religion. Right. Um, and it, that was a tough book to write. But then then it got fun. Then he said, let's do Patton. And I love the Patton book. That I mean, researching that was. I do, too. Epic. One of my favorites. Yeah. I wasn't a big fan of the Reagan book, um, but but we kind of had to get that one out of the way. But it was controversial because of the mental health stuff. And we got some of the, the hardcore Reagan people. Uh, we got some threats, I mean, some crazy threats. But, you know, we just kept going. And, and I learned a lot. Every book is like a, getting a master's degree in that particular topic. And I every every time we write it, I do all the research. And so I get to spend my days literally doing the deep dive into research and I think you'll remember back when I was first started writing for a competitor, I didn't know really know what reporting was. I just went to a race and I interviewed people and I wrote about the race and the whole idea of uh, just really doing the background research was something I had to learn on the fly. So from the time I began with competitor till the time I got into these killing books, you know, I I was kind of a self-taught researcher and it became the thing that actually it's, it's a real close second to the writing because I really love doing that hardcore research. So the Killing Patton book, which I have read over and over and over again. And so at the end, when you know, I'm going to give away the ending to some of our <laughs> viewers, but when, when Patton, did the, was there really a feeling that, that they were trying to get him, that they, were, they wanted him out? There is so much. Um, you know, part of the research for that was I went to the hospital room where, where he died and wow. they were just, they were, the U S army was just in the process of closing that base and, and giving it over to the Germans. So I literally got the last tour of, of the facility and it really, you know, I, I'd done the, you know, the background work on it and the Russians had a history of murder by a vehicle and it was, it was no, uh, stretch the imagination to know that that Patton was not popular with the Russians. He wanted to continue pushing the American army further and further east. And he was held back by Eisenhower and by Roosevelt. And um, he was very vocal about it. And he he clearly thought that the war should continue to push the Soviets further back. And they just, it, as far as I'm concerned, they eliminated him. So when you were doing the uh, Killing the Mob book, Obviously, there have been so many mob books. How did you guys go about making it different? You know, because we, we opened up with non-mobsters. If you read the first, you know, 80 pages, it's about um, you know, your depression era hoodlums, you know, Bonnie and Clyde and, and all, the, and, you know, Babyface Nelson and, you know, all those and John Dillinger. And then because we show what crime looks like, and that's kind of knucklehead crime, the way that they conducted their business. They did, they did a lot of stupid, crazy things just to justify the stuff. Then we get into the mafia, and then we talk, and they're more smooth, they're more incorporated, they're more polished, they're, they're, there's a longevity to them. And um, the real, I don't think that, we don't glorify the mob. We, and I think a lot of mob books either glorify the killings or glorify the mob itself. We just put it out there and we tell it in a way that people know the facts. Uh, but we also found kind of behind the scenes stuff that people don't know about how the mafia worked and like the Havana conference and all the little, you know, th- you know, we basically say, here's how it started. Here's how it's going. Here's how it intersects with the American government as it did during world war II and the invasion of Sicily. And here's why it's still going on today. And it's, um, it's an amazing because the publisher originally didn't really want to do that book. And we put it out there, you know, eight weeks on the New York times list at number one, it finally just it just fell off the list, and it uh, it's a really good book. I got to tell you something. You know, you write these killing books. You write all these books about death and murder and people hurting people. After a while, it it really kind of gets kind of sucks a little bit of your soul away. So I'm really glad to kind of take a break from killing at least for a little while. So after doing so many books about World War II, and then deciding to do taking Paris as as a solo venture. Were you concerned that, uh, what am I going to learn? I, I know everything. I, I've covered every aspect of this war. And what, what did you learn that surprised you? Well, that's a good question. Um, 
You know, I, I feel like I'm like most World War II, um, you know, scholars, for lack of a better word, or people who just read the, the popular narratives. And we focus a lot on everything post D-Day up until the fall of Berlin. And, and that's what most people focus on. And I wanted to go back and, for instance, I didn't know much about, you know, Rommel and the 7th Panzer Division sweeping across France in a week in May 1940. I didn't know anything about the Casablanca Conference and how the movie Casablanca was actually um, was actually uh, inspired by the fall of Paris in, in mm -hmm. 1940. Um, I, you know, I didn't know a, a lot about the, the desert campaign with Rommel and the French Foreign Legion and the Free French and the British. And at some point, if you are interested in a, in a subject, you want to fill in those gaps in your knowledge. You know, for instance, my wife and I, we, we, uh, I was thinking about doing a book about the invasion of Italy and it just, because I, you know, be a cool place to visit. <laughs> for yeah. of it. But we went, we went to Anzio beach, you know, where we, where we had landed in, you know, we had landed U S troops and it was a terrible place to land. And, uh, so at some point, I was realizing I didn't know the context of why Anzio was important. So literally, that's why I had to go back to May, open this book in May 1940 and tell the whole story of why we didn't invade France until 1944, you know, why the D-Day invasion didn't take place for four years, you know, all the things that happened, all the, the side, the odds and ends of the war, the little things that people don't know about, why they all mattered and why they all eventually led to D-Day, then they led to the fall of Paris. So the one book, when you know, Killing England and all the rest of it, the Killing Crazy Horse, that takes you in a totally different direction, right? All of a sudden, we're talking cowboys and Indians, and we're talking 1800s. What, what led to that, and what did you come away with from that? i got to tell you something. Uh, from a research point of view, Killing Crazy Horse was my absolute favorite book to write, um, hmm. simply because, well, we live in America, so a lot of these places, these battlefields where – and we're not just up at the little big horn. We're talking about several of the places where engagement took place between, you know, Indian tribes, Native American tribes, and settlers took place. I mean, just to walk those battlefields, many of which are, you know, in Wyoming and Montana, these, you know, beautiful windswept ranges. And I remember walk, I was walking one. Um, and there was a very significant master, massacre that takes place in the book, and I, I walked the battlefield and I saw how uh, the Sioux you know, lure the, the 80 men in, the 80 cavalry officers in, and then they rose up. I literally walked in their footsteps and I could see where the Indians hidden and I could see where uh, the cavalry was surprised and slaughtered. And I, and I could also, I could see the whole battle in full because I had studied it in depth beforehand. And, and to be there and stand there and just to feel that it was so powerful. I mean, that kind of research is just the best. So when you look at, uh, the, you know, Germany coming out of World War I and obviously uh, just, you know, destroy, they're de destroyed. Yeah. And how did, how did one crazy Austrian, how did one crazy Austrian <laughs> really mobilize that whole country to, to believe in what he was selling? Because you look back on it and it's like, Master race, it, it, it sounds ridiculous in this day and age. It does. And it's there are the similarities between some things going on in the world are very similar. A lot of oligarchs trying to do a very Hitler type thing with taking over an economy. But, you know, look at the, the Germans were, were on the ropes after World War One. We the, the 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 allies just punished them. They took away their military, but they also took all, all away all their their industrial might. I mean, the people were. There was, you know, a widespread rampant inflation. The people were unemployed, and they were looking for someone to blame. They blamed the Jews. They, you know, that's that's the first thing most people do when there's something that's going on. That's historically, but then they they wanted someone to kind of be their voice against the rich, uh, the rich people who who ran Germany at the time, who who clearly took some some blame for World War One. So, you know, Hitler was, you know, he was arrested, uh, and he spent some time in jail. That's when he wrote uh, Mein Kampf. But he came out and he had a following. And, and I always ask myself, how could the people of Germany do, you know, as soldiers between 1940, yeah. let's say 1939, 1945, do the things that they did to people in the name of and, and glorify and adore Adolf Hitler? It's because, you know, if you're a teenager, you've lived your whole life. You know, Hitler came up in the mid-1920s. 
Because if you're a teenager, you lived your whole life with that guy being the one person you who is the know-all and end-all, the, the the father figure for a nation, and you'll do anything for that guy. And that's, you know, like it or not, we there's a number of people like that in the world right now. Um, it, it's a little frightening, quite frankly, but to see that people could can worship someone like that. But I think at some point, a lot of people need someone like that in their life. And I'm not really quite sure why. So one of the things that hit me with the Killing Patton book was, uh, and I had no idea that Hitler was so drugged out on a daily basis. And in fact, this guy controlled the destiny of the world. And uh, in terms of what this guy was taking on a daily basis or was being administered to him, what was being administered to him? He had, he was taking... Uh, cocaine eye drops, which I think is fascinating. So I don't even know. Cocaine that, that. eye drops. Yeah. And then uh, I don't know how that works, you know, but, you know, he was a vegetarian. He was well known for his flatulence, but you can't call him out for his flatulence. He, he ate a very high fiber diet, but he was on a mixture of uppers and downers. He was a tea, he was almost completely a teetotaler, but at the same time, he, his physician, you know, he was getting you know injections for b12 and he was getting all these these drugs to m- regulate his his mood and his stuff and he went in in the eyes of, of people who were around him he went from being this very charismatic figure that people would follow to the end of the earth um to the end of the war as being just a, a kind of a a shell of a man who was you know very neurotic very um, psychotic you know completely paranoid about the fact that people were trying to kill him, which they were. Um, and, and whatever strategic genius he had. And early on, he actually was very brilliant with his strategy. By the end though, he was just delusional. So when, uh, um, the other thing I, I knew that Hitler, after reading your book, that Hitler was drugged. What I didn't know is that most of his troops were drugged too. That those guys were were taking uppers of some sort, and they were you know when you're taking stuff like that, you're Superman. So early in the war, the whole Blitzkrieg thing was these guys were were stoned out of their gourd. Well, they I'm not saying they had to be, but they it certainly helped because if you see pictures of the German army as they're advancing across France, I mean it's a nonstop, it's relentless advance from one side of France to the other, you know, trying to drive the British and the French back into the sea. Um, when the when the soldiers fell asleep, I mean, they literally, they just dropped to the ground and were out. They were they were so tired, in fact, that um, enemy soldiers would, would, you know, trying to, who would, or trying to get back to their lines and stuff like that, would walk through the, the German ranks with these people just passed out on the ground and utterly amazed that no one was raising a rifle to shoot them because they were so exhausted that when they fell, they just slept the sleep of the dead. So a little stimulant along the way goes along, does a lot of help. That is unbelievable to me. So with taking Paris, it, it just came out. Yep, um, what are what are your expectations? Oh, I don't know, Bob. Here's the thing: is uh, <laughs> I, I here's like I said before, I want to write for the rest of my life, and I, yeah. I want this, I want this book to do well enough that that um, that it just it just kind of. Keeps me keeps me going, you know. Lets me write the stuff that I want to write. That I don't need to uh, do a lot of, um, you know, ghost writing. You know, doing. I've, I've written a bunch number of books that just for the money, just to put, um, you know, without putting my own byline on there. I don't want to do that anymore. I I like writing in my own voice. I like writing with Bill. We're going to do some more books together. But you know, this book, I take a lot of pride in it because it's the first time that I've ever felt that I was writing without my critical parent looking over my shoulder. You know, I think every writer knows that feeling where you're writing, but there's that nagging voice that says, Oh, that's not very good. Oh, that's not very good. You can do better than that. Uh, why, why bother with this book? I just, I just felt like um, I was at the top of my game and I really uh, tried to take care of myself during the whole process. I, I got onto a very rigid schedule of, of editing at six o'clock in the morning and, and then, you know, writing for a good amount of time and just really, trying to make it sound like uh, you can hear my voice when you read the book as if I'm telling you a story about what happened in World War II. By the way, that's one of the first things you taught me. Now that I think about it, when I began writing for a competitor, I would call you and say, oh, I'm doing this. I'm having a hard time. You say, Marty, just tell me a story. And I would say, oh, okay. It's that simple. you know. And whenever I get stuck, um, I always go back to that thing. What, what I do 
is if I'm stuck on it, I go back to the tell me a story thing and I always start with once upon a time. And then I begin telling a story and it, it works every time. Every time. Absolutely. Yeah. Every time. So in the meantime, while you've been building this awesome career uh, selling, you know, 18 million, but am I right about that? 18 million or is it more than that now? Uh, it's 18 million. <laughs> That's nice. a lot of books. I think it's That's got a lot of books. Bit. Yeah, it's a lot of books. That's 18 million books. So in the meantime, you've been coaching. You've been coaching high school, uh, cross country and track, I think. Yep. And now you're training for Boston. Training for Boston. Uh, here's the thing. So I had a, a knee surgery back in 2013 and they did the microfracture. And at the time, my PT told me, he said, look, your running days are over. You need to become a swimmer, become a mountain biker. And right. I, you know, they're okay. I don't like to swim that much. I'll get in the pool, but I don't know, you know, I'll go 500 yards and get bored or, you know, I'll do that. I tried, I did Leadville back in 2014, but I also found too, that um, the mountain biking community, that's not my tribe, you know, nothing against them in every sport, every, whether it's triathlon or distance running or uh, mountain biking, everybody has their tribe. And I just didn't feel like I was ready to let go of the running tribe. And then a year ago, literally, I saw my PT and he said, uh, why aren't you running? Because I gained a little bit of weight. And he uh, I said, because you told me not, not to run. He goes, oh, no, no, you should run. You should be running now. It's with the, we, we changed the whole school of thought about that. You should be running. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> yeah. now, now you tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, four, four and a half weeks from now, I'm going to do Boston. Um, it's not, the, I did Boston 25 years ago. And I ran about a I had 102 degree fever. And I think I went three 40 ish, you know, you know, wrong with that sub four. I'll tell you what, if I go, if, you know, if I go six hours, I'll be happy. I just want to, I just want to get from one end to the other because, you know, here's the thing, Bob, I'm very, I'm just very blessed in my life. I've got a great family. I've got a great career and I want to keep it going. But one of the things I really miss, I really miss trail running. I, I miss just going out on the trail and being able to run an easy eight to 10 without it destroying me. And this is, I feel like this is my road back. This is my, not to, no pun intended, but I want to, I want to be that guy again. And I want to be able just to wake up on a Sunday morning, put my shoes on and, uh, you know, maybe even be skinny enough. I don't have to wear a shirt, you know, who knows, but I want to, I want to be that guy again. So that's well, my one of the, we, we read a lot, obviously Hitler, Stalin, Churchill, Roosevelt, De Gaulle is somebody who I don't know a lot about, which I'm excited to read your book to learn more about him. What did you learn about him that maybe you didn't know before? Well, you know, when I originally thought about the book, I thought he was just going to come in at the very end, you know, because that's when you, you think of de Gaulle as being the guy who lifted France up at the end of the war. And actually his, his relationship with, with Churchill was very instrumental in keeping all of Europe's hopes alive that the allies would one day return to the continent, you know, because when France fell and the government fled, de Gaulle refused to surrender to the Nazis. And he, he stowed away. He got himself to, to England. He, he and Churchill formed an alliance. Churchill let him use the BBC to broadcast messages to the French people, you know, and, uh, and de Gaulle is a really unlikely hero. He's, you know, he's, six, six and a half feet tall or so. He's got a kind of a narrow head. They said his head was like an asparagus, you know, he had a huge nose. His hips were wide. So the British press made fun of him and said he had women's hips. He chain smoked uh, chiton cigarettes to the point, you know, the tips of his fingers were stained. Um, he was very rude. And at the same time, and probably a little bit delusional, but at the same time, he believed, he alone believed that France needed to be saved and he was the man to do it. And I think to, to put yourself in that position is like, I'm the man, I'm going to save France, you know, and he did it though. That's the crazy thing. And he never lost hope and he never lost sight of the fact that, that was his dream. That is so cool. Yeah. I can't wait to, wait to read it again. The book is called Taking Paris. Where can people get it, Marty? Everywhere, it's everywhere. Right now it's uh, go to Amazon, go to any place that sells books and it's out there. And uh, I, I get a, I'll get you a copy, Bob. I've got I got boxes of books here, so I'm sure you get a copy. <laughs> I want a copy. Yeah. Again, Martin Dugar, one of my favorite people on the planet. He wrote. He was kind enough when we first started Competitor back in '87. He basically worked for <laughs> not for free, but close to free. No, for, I remember uh, the first time I got a check. It was my first ever writing check. You know, and I'd never been paid to write. And I didn't know what to ask for. I didn't, 
you know, so we didn't talk about it. So finally I, I said, hey, uh, what should I invoice you for? And I think you said for the first one, like $35. And I, and I thought, well, that's the going rate. And then you came back and I said, no, it's 150. And it, it was like, and, uh, but I, I was so proud of that check because it was, it was being paid to be a writer. And it was such a profoundly wonderful moment. You know, it's, it's not just a violin. It's not just your mom and dad saying, hey, you can be a writer. It's someone giving you money to write stuff that made me feel like I could, I could do it, you know, and I quit my corporate job and became a writer, you know, within five years. So here we are. Those, when I look back at those uh, the magazines from that era, 87, 80, it threw basically 2000, whatever. Uh, the cool part was I, I didn't believe in a lot of writers because I wanted to make sure people made some money. So it was basically me, you and Kenny McAlpine (laughs) writing every article in the magazine and uh, Lois taking photos and Rich Cruz taking photos. But, you know, it was a great little family. I remember that because when we would write, you know, it's like first first it's like I want to write like Bob or I want to write like Kenny. But then it became this competition. I know we all raised our game because like Kenny would write something great. I go, oh, I got to write something as good as Kenny's. Or you'd write something where you say, oh, I got to do that. And I, I really think people, if people go back and read those early issues, that was some actually some really good writing. Really good writing. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very proud of them. And I, I love the fact that from a production, we wanted to make sure we showcased the authors and the writers and the photography. And you look at those layouts with, you know, uh, Kathy Carradine was our graphic yeah. artist and just beautiful double spread layouts. The stuff you wrote for our competitor for women magazine, where we had Nathan below doing <laughs> photography and, and you doing the editorial on, yeah. I think it was team American pride or whatever yeah. it was. Um, it, that was some, that was some really, really good stuff. That was fun. That was a, uh, you know what? And here's the thing. It, it just, you know, you don't feel like you're paying your dues, but you're, you're paying your dues. You know what I mean? So at the time it was just like, I get to write for competitor and that's the coolest thing in the world. And I get to go to, I get to go to a race and I've got a competitor press pass around my neck and that's the coolest thing in the world. And it doesn't feel like you're paying your dues, but at the same time, I look back now and I go, that's how I learned to write. That's how I learned to punctuate properly. That's how I learned how to tell a story. You know, Beth Hagman used to just take me to the cleaners with her edits, but that's, that's how you get good. If someone's saying, Hey, you suck today, be better. <laughs> so yeah, Beth go. was, yeah, she, those red marks on your oh, copy. Yeah. That was bad stuff, man. But you're right. It always made us better. Don't, don't. Uh, my favorite was don't insult me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like that. Again. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, I think I pay your, I pay your, I write your check every month. Don't insult me. Yeah. Uh, no, she was the best. Marty, best of luck with taking Paris. I'm sure it's spectacular. All, everything you've ever written is, is wonderful. I, I remember one article you wrote for a competitor called Pink Shirts on the uh, Susan G. Komen Foundation event up in Orange County is still one that I can read over and over again, just because it's, it's so, Im- so impactful, so empowering, and it, it captures, uh, captures a very, very special moment. I'll, I'll tell my wife that because that's her favorite. She, every, every time I, I say, oh, I should do a collection of stuff, she goes, make sure you put pink shirts in there, you know? So, yeah, very emotional. I might have to put a book together, a collection of competitor articles. I've got them all. Right. Yeah. The best of competitor, you know, put it all together. I love it. We'll do it. Marty, again, the book is called Taking Paris. And you guys, everybody should get a copy of this book. And if you haven't read any of the killing books or any of Marty's other books, definitely, definitely uh, get out there. And you, Marty is sim- sim- simply one of the best writers of our generation. Uh, Marty and best of luck in Boston. Well, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll think of you as I cross the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> Again, my name is Bob Abbott. Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. See ya.